Coming up on today's Locked on Bucks, we take a look at the players poised for a breakout season. Whose numbers are due for a tick upward? Camille and I examine the candidates and share our thoughts next on Locked on Bucks. You are Locked on Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Bucks. I'm Justin Garcia, joined, as always, by Camille Davis. We thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen each and every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, and you can find us on YouTube as well. All part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Bucks is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. So, Camille, we did something similar a couple weeks ago where we uh, we did the reasons for optimism and reasons for pessimism for the Bucks this upcoming season. We touched on the fact that we were both pleasantly surprised it warmed our hearts to see that more of the interaction came with the positive show than the negative and it, it kind of dovetails off of what we talked about on yesterday's show too with the survey on the athletic by eric name where it seemed like there was a lot of realistic takes where you still hey we hope the bucks find this success right we don't expect it to be bad but we're ready for anything was kind of the approach um, the general mindset, I should say, that we saw in that survey. And it, it kind of ties into all of this as well as it's another one of those choose your own adventures. Are you more curious to see, okay, who are they going to talk about that could take a step forward or now I'm, I'm just here for the bad and I want to see who could be prime for some uh, bit of regression. So this one is dealing with the positives. Those players that we think are most in line for a bounce back season. The way we've structured this is essentially veterans, young players. And then if there is any type of hot take, you want to get off your chest, we'll reserve that for the end of the show. So saying all that, we're going to start with the veterans. And uh, if we limit it to just one name a piece, I don't know how many you had, but if it was one, I feel pretty strongly that we've probably chosen the same player. So I'll just say, in terms of the vets, who I think is more than prime for a quote-unquote bounce-back season, mm -hmm. and that is Damian Lillard for all the reasons that we've talked about throughout the course of the summer, uh, the headspace, the familiarity with his teammates, the system, mm -hmm. a coach that he knows, teammates that he knows how to play off of, more time not only in the gym and the workout videos that we've seen from Dame, but time with those teammates as well that you know not to stray too far into the other episode but if, if it doesn't happen this year knowing all that that's where the questions start to mount yeah i feel like that's the a great place to start because it's such an important part of this team for dane to bounce back theoretically and it's one of those things when you look at the numbers as we've mentioned before uh, a lot of numbers were down to levels that we haven't seen from dame in years but one number that stood out to me was the fact that he played 73 games yep. this past season. And that was the most games that Dame has played in any season since the 2018-19 season. So that is one positive look at from the season with Dame here in Milwaukee, his first one here. But two things that we alluded to over the summer, uh, he mentioned how difficult last season was for him. And in an offseason interview that he did a few weeks ago at this point, he mentioned the fact that as soon as he got to training camp, he just kind of knew like something's not right. Like I'm not all the way right. Um, so Dame is somebody who this particular offseason has been really attacking it. And he's made claims himself. He said it out of his own mouth that, you know, I am going to come into the upcoming season, the 2024-25 season in great shape. I'm going to be ready to go. And people are going to be surprised at how much a regular offseason uh, will do for my game. So Dame is somebody who definitely counting on having a big bounce back, but also needing to have a big bounce back for this Bucks team to achieve the levels that it wants to achieve. But Justin, a question for you in your mind, like what does an improved Dame season look like? Is it just the raw shooting numbers going up? Is it the assist? Is it, is it the wins? Like, what is it for you that will look like, you know what? 
this is the dame I've been waiting for. Um, not to um take a, a cop out answer, but I mean, I think number one, it's the eye test, right? That we've talked about this yeah. before too, in that uh it wasn't consistent a year ago. And there's a multitude of reasons why that we've gone over and over and over, but it was, you would get that Dame performance and then you want to get another one for three, four, five or more games. So shortening those gaps is a big part of it. To me, it's, it's not necessarily that Dame has to score 30 points. You just went through these games last year where you could tell, I don't know if the shot is there. And part of that is, is him getting in a rhythm early, which I think we saw the Bucks address at times last season and especially when doc rivers took over so that's going to be imperative um but just the look of you know the eye test and how he looks and yeah okay that's that's the dame that i remember is a big part of it i think the easiest part to quantify with numbers is efficiency right that we we talked a couple weeks ago on the efficiency numbers for Dame across the board. It was the lowest we had seen if you take out some of those injury shortened seasons since I think his third year in the league. You got to go back a decade already in the 14 15 season, but um, it just didn't really match. I think the tricky part is last year may well be the outlier, not even for the bet, not even that it's the outlier. It just wasn't what you expected. Uh, the year prior to that was probably the outlier for the good because of the games played and everything else. So we just haven't gotten a normal Damian Lillard season for what feels like two or three years now. Yeah, consistency was the piece that I was going to go to as well, where it's like there were the, the, the slumps there where it's like, OK, January starts off and it's like it's not a good start to January for Dame. I don't want to have months where it's like it's just not a good start for him, like how we praise Giannis for the consistency. And again, I mean, part of it is shot diet, so on and so forth, but uh, it, it's it's just being there every night to depend on that performance to come through. Even if it's not a 30 ball, like you mentioned, just the consistency of, okay, we know the Dame can knock down, you know, 37% of his, of his threes. If you want to quantify it down to raw numbers, for an example, um, you don't want to see it fluctuating so much where one month, you know, he shot 22% from three and then it's, 45% from three, yeah. but that consistency piece, I think is going to be really big for Dame. Like we mentioned how Giannis was that consistent piece throughout the year last year, where you could count on Giannis to get his numbers night in and night out when he was on the court and to do what he does defensively. And that part for Dame, I'm going to be really curious to see how Doc uses him because we did hear last year as well about him saying like, well, I know he can do a little something more than what we've seen at times before. Is it like, I'm looking to keep you in at the end of the game, which we've heard before when Dame was pulled at the end of the game under doc, where he was like, this don't, I don't like that. I want to be on the court in the closing moment. So I'll be curious to see as well as defensively, which isn't what you're counting on Dame for, uh, but he's going to have to be able to defend in that team concept of what doc puts together. And that was the other interesting thing about last year was you had the breakout performance to start his Bucks career yep. against the 76ers in the season opener. And he followed that up. Was it the second game or third game where he had his lowest scoring total and by the numbers, his worst game to that point, arguably of his career uh, against the Atlanta Hawks. And I think people from Portland, if you were a Bucks fan that was seeking out that opinion, went, ah, don't worry, he's kind of a slow start and he picks things up. The funny part is the numbers don't necessarily back that up. So it kind of ties into the eye test thing is it doesn't, it doesn't back it up in the sense that it's not a prolonged slump. And that's kind of what we saw too, is it really started in what early November in that game that Giannis missed against the Raptors, where that was okay. Now I feel like the Portland Dame where he was running things and things were clicking for a couple of weeks. But then as you started, or as you mentioned, it started to shift downward. So I, I think Damian Lillard is, you know, not only obviously, I think the the clear candidate for who is in line for a bounce back may be harsh, but that type of season, but he's also going to be the most important for that to be the case. Yeah, and to your point about the eye test and when it looks right, uh, it's that chemistry as well with him and his teammates on the floor that we're looking to see, I think, next season as well. And I think about the games that they had with against the Lakers. I, they lost it 
but yep. Dame and Giannis both. Dame and Giannis really were figuring cold. out the two man. Yep. Exactly. And that's to the eye test point of what I'll be looking for as well. Like, how does this look? Is it is it a situation where he's getting his points, but it seems disconnected or disjointed from the rest of the team? Or is it a situation where he's able to get his points, get his assists, and you're seeing it's because of the leverage and the gravity that he's creating with his teammates? So it's a few things to keep an eye on with Dane, but he's somebody who, if I had to bet money, which I'm not telling y'all to do, this is not betting advice. <laughs> like Dame is definitely somebody I would bet some money on that come back stronger than he was last year. And then we'll have to check what FanDuel has uh, available for Damian Lillard specific <laughs> entries this season. You may oftentimes hear growth is not linear. Mm -hmm. um, we hope it is for a handful of players, and we'll explain who those players are coming up after this on Locked on Bucks. Time to talk to you now about our friends over at Game Time. You have heard Camille and I mention them quite a bit when it comes to your ticket purchasing experience. Maybe you're just coming out of that period of the year where you're hitting the road, road trips to baseball stadiums. You may be starting some new ones to college football stadiums or even eventually within the next month or so getting out to some NBA arenas. That is where Game Time comes in with the ultimate assist, making your ticket purchasing experience the best and easiest there is of anyone on the market. I'm going to tell you why. You get the all-in pricing feature. You toggle that on. You see the total upfront cost. No sticker shock once you get to checkout. You can see seat views, a panoramic view from your seat within the app before you buy your tickets on Game Time. And best of all, it comes with the lowest price guarantee where Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference if you can find those seats cheaper elsewhere and your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry so take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account and use the code locked on nba to get 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem that code locked on nba l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n-n-b-a to get $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. Thank you for making Locked on Bucks your first listen each and every day. And for that second listen, we invite you to check out the Locked on NBA podcast. There is no offseason in the NBA. And on Locked on NBA, you get daily basketball analysis from national and local experts in 30 minutes or less. No one keeps you as informed and entertained as Locked On NBA. Available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Uh, I mentioned the uh, growth and how linear it uh, may or may not be. And it's another one of these things that we've talked about a bit over the summer where you have a number of guys that you are hoping it is, in fact, linear with. and. You know, we talked about this last year, Camille, the, the interesting part going into Summer League and just overall keeping tabs on this team is the number of young guys we are very, very uh, invested in seeing their development this season, more so than any year I can remember. Not to say that these are blue chip prospects or guys that you think can become all-star caliber players, mm -hmm. but as we've learned, you know, the hard way the last couple of years, Finding those key cogs of rotational players is just as important. That's what the Bucs think they may have here with some of these guys. So it's not to limit it to just uh, guys that were rookies a year ago, but anybody that's really under their fourth year, four years and under coming into this season. So that's, what, six guys, five guys that we're looking at for this group. Um, I started last one. I'm going to put you on the spot this time. Of all the young guys, who is most poised to take that step forward this season? I'm going to go with A.J. Green. A.J. Green is the guy I'm going to call out here. I, I thought of Chris Livingston, but if that's, I wanted to leave that for you in case you wanted to go that route. But A.J. Green, I mean, he's had a limited role for this team off the bench for the last two seasons. And in that limited role, A.J. Green has shown that he has an elite skill set, and that is shooting the three ball. He's a 41% career three-point shooter on an average of about three shots a game. So while the volume's not crazy high, it's a good volume to know, good enough to be like, okay, 
this is a skill that you actually possess. It's not like he's shooting one a game or less than one a game, shooting at a high clip. Um, and with that being said, I mean, he was one of the guys who we did not see this year in summer league. He got the third year guy who got the summer off. He graduated, um, as I kept joking, from summer league this summer. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do because, again, he's one of the best shooters on the roster. And you can fit him into any lineup. The question with A.J. Green is going to always come back down to that defense. And how is that aspect of his game, go if, that's, if that's going to allow him to be on the court? Because the shooting, the spacing, that's beautiful. Real skill set. But it's that defensive piece of can he do enough defensively uh, to get on the court for, you know, more than 10, 11 minutes uh, on average? Can he push that up to 15, maybe 20 minutes a game? Um, if things broke really, really well for him. So I, I know what uh, you think I'm going to do and what all the everydayers think I'm going to do with and take who you reference, Chris Livingston. I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm fighting a lot of, <laughs> of willpower here, but I'm not going to take him. To me, it came down to uh, one simple thing, and that is who has a skill set that is – most plug and play. And I think there's really two answers. You took one of them in AJ Green. He has the shooting ability. We saw him hold his own defensively a season ago where he was at least good expected. enough, better than we all expected. I know Frank eats some crow on that too. Um, he has that. I think I would grade him above the next name I'm going to list because there's still, a, I got to see a little work on that. But I think the other obvious choice is Andre Jackson Jr. And that's who I am going to go with because of the defensive component, and especially what you mentioned with Damian Lillard. You know, the Bucks have improved their perimeter defense. It's not to say it is going to be a top five defense in the league, but these guys that they brought in there, uh, regardless of what Lakers fans are going to tell you, Torian Prince is going to help you. At the very least, he is an upgrade over Jay Crowder in some of those perimeter-based matchups and even sometimes taking on uh, fours in those assignments. DeLon Wright is a massive upgrade yeah. for the Bucs. I know David Aldridge was just on with Marcus Johnson on their podcast on Bucks Plus a week ago talking about it as well and what he does to disrupt things within the game, tracking deflections and loose balls that he comes up with and how much havoc he can create out there. So he's going to be a massive boost for this team. You still can't get zeros from Damian Lillard and the rest. It's not just to put all of it on Dame. Gary Trent Jr., his defense is going to be very important for this team as well. We think it's going to be better than Malik Beasley's, but it can't drift into that territory. So I, I, I think you feel more than good about the offense that's on this team, and the question is still going to be defense, and especially on the perimeter. And the only guy that we've gone over that I think you could say, okay, if if everything goes right for you and you work on all these things that we talked about, if the foul rate comes down, I could see some movement here and I could see some impact. That's Andre Jackson Jr. So I, I think those are the two most clear candidates for this. And, and we mentioned the other names of I would love for it to be Chris Livingston. Um, you know, Marjan Bochamp, this isn't to pile on Marjan. I just don't know what to realistically expect and, and what you could set for expectations for Marjan this season. So to me, it's it just comes down to that of who has the skill set that we can plug and play. And it's those two guys on different ends of the floor. Yeah, they have the skill set. In addition to that, we saw both of those guys get some run under Doc in the playoffs at that. Yeah. Um, again, we know injuries played a role in that because the Bucs had to soak up some minutes without Giannis out there. There were some games without Dame. So there were a lot of minutes that the Bucs had to soak up. But yet and still, uh, the fact that you saw an A.J. Green out there on the court, that you saw an Andre Jackson Jr. And A.J. Green didn't have a great playoff series. That skill set, that three-point shooting, it, it was not there for him against the Pacers. So a hope, again, is that going into this season, the playoff experience helped. He's aware of what's going to be expected. He attacks it and he comes back better. Andre Jackson Jr. is another guy where it's like the defense is the piece of his game that you can see, the athleticism you can see. And this is on a Bucks team that is in dire need of athleticism, as we've seen, just that speed and being able to move in the way that Andre Jackson Jr. can. But the thing for Andre is like the flip side of A.J. Green, which is like 
can his shooting be a big enough threat uh, so that he's just not completely abandoned? Not, not just shooting. Yeah. I mean, scoring period offensively. And that yeah. I think of our two choices, your candidate in AJ green is probably the most likely to fill this just because of that, in, in that any questions you have defensively, I mean, I, I think you could point to guys. We have more questions on this roster yeah, defensively, but with Andre Jackson Jr., um, it's not just the shooting. It's the total offensive picture. And can we progress past a point where, man, it's just a tough sell to have him on the floor at the same time as Giannis or, or anybody else that may not bring uh, that shooting ability? That's going to be the biggest tell for him this upcoming season. It is. And one thing, too, thinking about Andre's game, uh, you mentioned just the offense in, in general. Um, he shot 37% from three last year, uh, albeit on a very, 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 I want to emphasize, very low volume, like less than one attempt per game. Very low volume and primarily corner threes. Exactly. Although we did see him make some above the break. Yeah, so that was something that was interesting to me because I didn't expect that at all from his game. And I do wonder next year because – if AJ Green is the candidate where it's like it's more likely to happen, I think if Andre Jackson Jr. can hit, it's a bigger uh, gain for this particular team, just as we've mentioned, because of the lack of defense that we saw them have last year. If he can come through with that, um, it's going to add so much to this particular team and what they can do, um, especially if that offensive game and that expanding is not just the scoring, but the playmaking that we saw him flash in college. If he's able to create for his teammates as well. It'll be a really, really big boom for the Bucks. All right. If there is a bold prediction for this team, good news only, what would that be? We will get into that conversation and wrap things up next on Locked on Bucks. Time to talk to you about our friends over at FanDuel. You have heard us mention them quite a bit. They're America's number one sports book. We have something a little different for you now, as through September 22nd, this Sunday, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then, with a YouTube TV base plan, you will be able to watch every regular season, Sunday afternoon, out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. Just visit FanDuel.com and download America's number one sports book. All right, Camille, the uh, the bold prediction time for the episode. Um, I mean, I, I suppose I could go with my guy, Chris Livingston, and say, hey, bold prediction, he's going to break on through. Brand. But that would also kind of negate uh, not choosing him for the uh, young player to uh, take a step forward. I've already said early in the summer, my bold prediction was that he was going to play in what I think was like 55 games matching whatever we saw uh, from A.J. Green. Mm -hmm. I'm not married to this, but to me, <laughs> and, and I think you know what it is as we were talking before the show, to me, the definition of bold, this would fit it. And that is everybody's favorite whipping boy is a rotational piece once again. And this is the bounce back right. at Connaughton season where he's a reliable, trustworthy, okay, um, we're not going to go too far, too extremes of, man, he can defend one through fours, but it'll give you some defensive versatility. The shot is there consistently. That's probably the biggest piece because we've always seen Pat add some things too of, He's one of the few guys that is able to put the ball on the floor and attack the basket outside of Giannis. He's just very good at cutting. And I know I talked last year, too, about points created per shot attempt with Pat Connaughton on the floor. Up until, what, February? Sometime around there, it was up to career numbers for Pat that he was doing a lot to facilitate the offense and he was asked to basically be a backup point guard at times. So those things kind of make sense. Then we saw... Uh, I guess you could say it fall off a cliff and i think the number one thing that backed that up was hearing doc rivers put it into words as i'm trying to get pat Connaughton's confidence back so that's my basis and starting point is we know doc rivers trusts him and values him 
and you can go ahead and make the joke of, well, it's because he's a veteran and that's what Doc Rivers does. Fine, but that's even more reason to back this up of if there's anyone you're not expecting it from and you've already written off on this roster, he's the guy that would make the most sense to not be you know, an all-star, certainly not, not even be their best bench player, but to just be someone that you trust and know is going to be assignment short and the shooting is up there again. Not a collective groan from a large portion of Bucks fans anytime he checks into the game. I tell you what, you understood the assignment of what bold meant here because, I mean, outside of just the noise that we hear around Pat Connaughton, when you look at the shooting, which is the first thing that comes to mind with, like, what has been missing from Pat Connaughton's game, like, he shot below 35% from three for two straight years now. Yeah. And it's not as if he's somebody who gets a high volume at that. So it's like the threes that he's getting, um, it's like we need you to knock him down when you're out there. And in addition to that, like Pat Connaughton is a guy who does like the little things on the court, the rebounding, the the passing, the cutting, um, just making the right play, the smart play. Um, and if he can get back to that where it's just like that con- that consistency and that confidence in his game to carry out that role, of course it's going to be a positive for the Bucks, especially given the fact – Um, They have him under contract this year, and he has a player option next year as well. So, like, if he can have a great year for the Bucs, even if he doesn't remain on the Bucs, just adding more value to what he does, even if it's not value to the Bucs, just value to his game, period. Um, Because when I was looking at the three-point shooting just this past season, like, he was the second worst three-point shooter on the team, just looking at guys who actually played real minutes, like at least 10 minutes a game. Pat Connaughton was second. The only guy who shot the ball worse from him from three was Giannis. Um, and that's what we expect from Giannis because of where the other areas here where he's elite at. But Pat Connaughton's a great one. I don't have a bold prediction, so to speak. Uh, but there is somebody on this team, like older guy, who I was like, if he comes through, like he's going to be big for the Bucks. And that was DeLon Wright. And before we started recording, I made a joke when I was like, I didn't realize that Pat Connaughton's 31 and DeLon Rice 32. So it's like they're right in that same age bracket, the king of deflections, DeLon Wright. Um, listen, it's and it's not out of the realm possibility of why you would think I would pick him. Like the Bucks weren't great defensively. Point of attack defense was a weak point for them all last year. And DeLon Wright fills that role in. Um, and on top of that, he's been historically a pretty good three-point shooter. Not knock your socks off, but he's going to knock down at least about 35% of those. So uh, he's somebody who I think can have a really big year for the Bucks and a really important role. Here's the – I and when you were setting up yours, I, I thought you were going to go with Torian Prince. Um I guess here's the the case against the Pat Connaughton bold prediction. And again, I'm not totally married to it, but just kind of keeping ourselves on track with the assignment, that to me was the one that made the most sense. But the case against it would be, um, okay, if this happens, who is that coming at the expense of? So it does feel like it's going to contradict something I said earlier and that if Pat Connaughton is a bounce back season – I don't think you're seeing the leap forward for Andre Jackson Jr. It may even cost A.J. Green as well because that's the interesting part about the roster makeup and part of the black hole that uh, only part, but what Marjan Bochamp fell into as well. When you look at the guys in a similar position to you on the roster in front of you, those minutes have to come from somewhere. So it's a good problem to have. If Pat Connaughton does refine his footing here, but um, it would also make for very interesting discourse around this team because it's only going to intensify the Doc Rivers doesn't play young guys. Because I just, if Pat Connaughton has a bounce back season, I frankly don't see any way that guys like Andre Jackson Jr. and AJ Green aren't seeing their minutes throttled. Yeah, and that's tease for the regression episode. That's part of the reason why Pat Connaughton is one of my regression candidates, because it's like there's a log jam at that position um, at the moment. Just those that wing, those guards with just with Pat Connaughton, with A.J. Green, with Andre Jackson Jr., with DeLon Wright. Like there's a lot of different bodies um, there to soak up those minutes. So for Pat Connaughton, again. We, we're we cheering for the Bucs. We want the Bucs to win a championship, and we would love for everyone uh, to have a great year. So 
that's why the Pat Connaughton fits for sure in that bold prediction category, because we've seen the numbers coming down over the last couple of years for him. But we can't acknowledge the championship without acknowledging the fact that Pat played a crucial role in that yeah. as a bench guy, especially when the Bucks went small because of his prowess of rebounding the ball for his position. Um, so he's definitely one of those guys, but there's a lot of bodies um, at that position on this Bucks team. Even the year after um, we saw spurts too, when Pat was playing small ball four. For yeah. Them. And, and look, that's already two plus years ago. Um, you mentioned the eight. I mean, he's 29 years old then. It's it's interesting because it's a similar discussion with Damian Lillard when we can point to, well, last year was last year the outlier for the bad. You can't say that without ignoring the age and the fact that once you get to that certain age, you do historically start to see some downturns from players, especially the size and the wear and tear a Dame has taken on throughout his career. Pat Connaughton's going to turn 32 this season and uh, just six games that he missed last season. This may be hopium, but I, I do wonder a full year removed from that if that was part of it as well, because the two years prior to that, he uh, he missed, what, almost 40 games combined with leg and calf or hamstring injuries uh, those two seasons. So that's the thing I, I think you would cling to is, look, Doc is going to give every chance in the world to veterans. Yeah. So Pat Connaughton's going to have a runway. And maybe it's just further removed from recovering from those injuries. The shooting is the biggest piece, though. That is That's what's going to determine – how much he's on the floor. Yeah, he's going to have to knock down those shots because as we mentioned, like it's not as if he's putting up, you know, six, seven threes a game like Malik Beasley was last season. It's, you know, three, four or so that he's going to get. Um, and then those opportunities, he's got to knock them down. And that's part of when that championship run, you think about like Pat Connaughton would hit some timely shots yep. for this team. And that's what a role player does. You're not going to have the ball often. And when you do get it, can you make the most of those moments? So outside of the shooting, which, I agree with is the biggest piece for him. Um, Pat Connaughton, if he's going to be that glue guy, he's going to have to do all of those little things well as well, um, including the rebounding. Because as we you mentioned, we brought up when he played some small ball four at times. Don't necessarily see that in the cars for him, but rebounding is a position or a, a spot on this team where we've had the conversations of like they need to do a bit better job of that. Yeah. So uh, Pat Connaughton can help in that regard as well. It's just the fact that um, it's a lot of guys. Um, at that position on this roster going into this season. Wasn't good in the playoffs uh, last year, but again, you didn't have Giannis. You didn't have Dame for a couple of those games. It was it was a very weird stretch of postseason basketball for the Bucs, and he was good in uh, each of the, the previous, what, four playoff runs. And honestly, um, maybe too was partly just because of the fact that he was asked to do some things that he hasn't had to yeah. do in the NBA level, like play point guard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, he was he was one of the few bright spots in that series against the Miami Heat. He was he obviously made some huge plays in the run through the championship, uh, even the year they lost to the Celtics. He was pretty good overall. I mean, it's it's kind of what we've talked about with Grayson Allen and other players mm -hmm. of look, you're asking them to do more. Like the the absence of Chris Middleton really put them in a precarious and uh, an unenviable spot. So let us know what you think. I am anticipating my. Uh, not fully married to it, but quasi bold proclamation of look, if there's anybody that's primed for it. It's Pat Connaughton. I'm assuming that is not going to be received very well, but let us know in the comments, leave your thoughts as well. Uh, all three of those categories. What is your bold prediction for this season on the positive side for individual performances? Which of those veteran players do you think is in line for a bounce back season? And the young guys, who are you most looking forward to taking a step forward? this upcoming season as camille mentioned uh we went through the ice cream portion now we have to eat the vegetables coming up next on tomorrow's show we get into who's in line possibly here for some regression so we'll uh, get into that conversation that will do it for today's show though for camille i'm justin we'll talk to you once again tomorrow on locked on bucks